preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hi, good evening and welcome to the 92nd Street Y. My name is Deborah Nadel McGee and I am the director of the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning and we present this program to you tonight. This evening is actually the final program of our Wizards of the Dance series, a series of new films highlighting the lives and careers of great dancers, choreographers, and teachers. The program is presented in cooperation with the 92nd Street Y Harkness Dance Center and conceived in collaboration with the Dance Films Association. Our moderator tonight is our very, very good friend, Deborah Jowett, we all know very well as the dance critic for The Village Voice. Following the screening of tonight's film, Dance Maker, Ms. Jowett will be talking with Matthew Diamond about his experience creating the film. For now, would you please join me in welcoming, as I said, our very, very good friend, Deborah Jowett. Thank you. I'm sure some of you in this audience can remember when the film Martha Graham, A Dancer's World first came out. We were so amazed that there could be a documentary uh, giving a, a fairly full picture of dance and some sort of insight into its creation. There had been dance films, of course. There had been pioneering efforts in dance video. But we've come a long, long way in terms of sophistication of dance films, the Dance in America films, uh, videos for instance, uh, editors who could, who, who knew how to cut Balanchine, how, I mean knew, knew how to edit cuts of, of, of Balanchine ballets so that the musical flow carried across the, the cut. And so it's been sort of extraordinary this year or this, spring to see three and now a fourth uh, new dance documentaries. This one um, is, as you know from all the hoopla and from reading your program, um, won three important awards and was nominated, Matthew Diamond was nominated um, for another, um, the Directors Guild of America Award for Outstanding Direction and also for an Academy Award. And this was, of course, you know, those of us who sat in front of our television set, sort of knowing somehow they would never give an Academy Award to a dance film. But, you know, just to have it nominated was important enough. And so it's, it's quite an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, it's an hour and a half long. So we're going to watch it. And when we finish, we're, uh, I'm going to be talking on, there'll be a brief pause while they set up the chairs and some microphones. And I will be talking with the director, Matthew Diamond, whom I knew as a dancer in Jennifer Muller's company, and Paul Taylor. So sit back and enjoy the film.
the applause. I think this is the most production we've ever had here to have the curtain open and reveal the guests. <laughs> it's a new theatrical peak. No, from now on, we'll demand it. Uh, so we have here Matthew Diamond and Paul Taylor uh, to talk a little bit about the film and other things that connect with it. Um, Paul, how did you decide to let this film happen? I mean, did it just did he just pounce on you in the dark and? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was Wally Schur's idea. Wally Schur is um, on my company's board of directors, and he's uh, had other documentaries done, and uh, so he, you know, the idea started with him, and then Matthew, of course, seemed to be the best one to do it. Was and and we'd worked together before, and mm -hmm. so I trusted Matthew and. Uh, dance, in, dance in America? Uh, yeah, it was, there were two Dance in America programs. So you trusted him? Oh yeah, it was, absolutely. And you knew, he'd, you knew he'd been a dancer, so he would take orders or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he knew I had been one too, so he knew Sorry. I'd take orders. He would take orders, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you... Um, did, so you were approached to do this, or the idea came to you, or how did um, Walter Scheuer, who is here tonight, I'm very proud to say, um, approached me with the idea that he was interested in doing a documentary about Paul Taylor. It was simply that. I had um, directed two programs for Dance in America of, of Paul's works. One was Speaking in Tongues, and one was a kind of three-dance yeah. Evening, um, Company B, and Field of Grass, and uh, um, Funny Papers. Yeah. And Mr. Scheuer approached me and said, do you want to do a documentary about Paul Taylor? I said, nah, don't like documentaries that much. Thanks very much. And call again. Um, <laughs> and he actually called back and said, are you, really, are you serious? I said, OK, you know, let me think about it. And I did, and I came back and had some ideas. And um, Mr. Scheuer seemed to like those ideas very much. I told Paul kind of what I would be doing and, you know, pretty much sort of just wanted his total trust and access to everything I wanted. Um, no, the kind of the idea was, if you're going to get reluctant later, both Paul and the administration and the dancers, if you're going to get reluctant later, say no now, because we'll save a lot of time and trouble. Mm -hmm. And if you can feel open and trust me, um, then maybe we'll get something. And fortunately, they said yes. So you sort of became a part of this dysfunctional family that Ken Tosti <laughs> talked about and followed them around all the time. Yeah. Um, Mostly. Well, we, it, it seems like we're there constantly. And I think that's um, you know, sort of a miracle of editing and planning and whatever. But with films have a budget. You know, there's this sort of reality. You have to book a crew and buy film and process the film and look at it. and. I think we shot for 25 days or 24 days over the course of 10 months mm -hmm. in 1997. Well chosen. So, did, so you never, did you get completely used to Matthew being there or did you feel some mm -hmm. kind of constraint? No, I felt I, I could forget him easily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the crew, I must say, were, became friends and, yeah. and they were very, very nice and yeah, very sure. considerate, really. It wasn't a big deal. I, I think the dancers probably felt pretty much that way, too. I, had, I haven't talked to them about it, really. Well, it's brought out in the film that choreography is a social event. So in a sense, you... Yeah, you said that. I said that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ah, I was quoting yourself. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> yeah. So uh -huh. that in a way, one is used to... You're, you're used to having to work on the spot. I mean, I, that, like uh -huh. the scene with Francie where you're, you're... Yes, but we're not usually watched, but somehow, you know, that... I think the beginning with Francie, that sequence, was one of the first times that the camera had been in the studio with us, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I was... You know, trying to obviously trying to think up steps, and obviously having a terrible time <laughs> doing it. Um, and not to make excuses, but I think I was a little, because it was so new, having people watch me make up a dance. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I mean, other than the dancers. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I, it was really uh, later that I really could, you know, I felt very easy yeah. having them around. And then, of course, the is the is it put together? The footage is not. No, it's not. I know in strict chronological order. You you've you've played a little bit with the timing so that something that happened later appears earlier, earlier appears. It's um, it's sort of largely chronological. It's not really strictly chronological. If if you actually um, dissect what happened in relation to what was going on. Um, Paul was not creating that dance both before India and then before City Center and then, at, I mean, there's things we play with, but at a certain point you're telling, um, you're telling a story that tells what happened in a way that people can understand what happened, rather than, you know, reality is sort of clumsy and not very well ordered. <laughs> and when you structure things to tell a story, it moves it in. And what you're trying not to do is misrepresent what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say that everything you see in order happened or was said in an mm -hmm. interview, by no means. You had to stage some of the scenes, obviously. Like, you had to stage, well, you have to say to Patrick, can I come and watch you wake up in the morning, don't you? That's, but, but that's all we would say. I mean, I said to Patrick, we were on tour in India. We had gone to um, Delhi with the company. And I was sort of racking my brain saying, what am I missing? What have I forgotten? You know, mm -hmm. you have these rare opportunities to shoot. And I went, oh my god, of course, waking up in the morning, it's so painful. So I said to Patrick, what time do you wake up? And he said, I don't know, whatever it was, 7.30 or something. And I said, could we, could we just watch you wake up? I mean, all I want to do, give me the spare key. We'll come and don't do anything different than what, I was the eighth person to say it to him that night. Um, <laughs> um, but I said, don't do anything different. We'll just be there. And you can see because when the phone is first ringing, we're in the room, but we didn't pull back the curtains or turn on a light, no, nothing. And then I just said, do whatever you do. And we're just going to be shooting. And he did. But, but it's more that, you know, can we come in the dressing room? Can mm -hmm. we be in rehearsal? I didn't ask him to get up and say, have a shower, then smoke a cigarette, and drink. I mean, we didn't do that. No, I understand. I just meant that you had to negotiate how to do that. Like you had to say to Jill and Terry, can I watch you pack? Or Absolutely. That, so that it takes more planning than, than one might think at first. Because it seems, you know, you forget that. You're there. The, the tricky part of the planning, you sort of assume that mostly you're going to get a yes, unless you're being so intrusive into somebody's intimate moment, um, like going to the bathroom or something, which you don't want to shoot anyway. That's not what the film is about. But you actually have to decide when you're booking a crew and planning for film and getting permits for vans, and you have to decide a month in advance what will be the most dramatic day the most interesting day in the life of the Paul Taylor Dance Company a month from now. Well, who knows? You know, I mean, I don't know that music's going to go off, and I don't know if Paul is going to just stop one minute into rehearsal and say, you know what, I'm out, let's rehearse an old dance. I mean, you're guessing a lot, and we got very fortunate. Yeah, you certainly did. Um, I was wondering how it felt to you, you know, Dancers will reveal some things to the choreographer, and you live with them so closely, you know a lot about them. But then you hear them talking about the experience of being in the company. Um, Francie saying, I'm not sure when I'm supposed to, you know, make a suggestion or not. Mm -hmm. Did, is that all mm -hmm. sort of surprising to you to hear? Not in Francie's, Francie's oh. case. Or, I, I seem perfectly logical. Yeah for her to say that to me. I was, that didn't surprise me. No. I, I guess it's just, I think it's always strange to hear people talk about you when you... Well, yes, of course it is. However affectionately. But then I'm used to reading reviews, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got to be tough. But that, that, was, that was an amazing sequence with the dancers continuing to dance with the music. We, you know, we get all the backstage mm -hmm. activity mm -hmm. with you know, people desperately rushing around mm -hmm. and they find this, get this, and, and they Well, it, it was not a total surprise to us because 
you know, the electricity in New Delhi goes off about three times a day. <laughs> and we, you know, we were, we had a plan as, as this happened before, you mm -hmm. just keep going and hope it'll come back on. And if it doesn't, they just bring the curtain down, mm -hmm. you know. Was, so they they were they had been warned they knew what to do. But that you know it means their timing was so. Perfect. Well, that's the amazing that thing. Was, but you, as as a dancer, you know dances when they're rehearsed often enough that the muscles uh, react in a very regulated time mm -hmm. that you can you know in a long span of minutes it can, will be the same right down to the second. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. But it's true. Mm -hmm. And so they were, when the music had been running, we couldn't hear it. They couldn't hear it. But uh, as you probably figured out, the, when it finally did come back on, they were right where they should have been, right on the beat. There wasn't any variation. They weren't late. They weren't early. Yeah, it was heroic. It was, I mean, wasn't that nice? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, I've, I've interesting how the camera acts upon dance. For instance, I've always thought Esplanade, the, the last section of Esplanade, was terrifying, fast, and you know, and the camera makes it look even faster. The opening sequence. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It just looks. It's, it's almost as if there's a blur, but it's but there's not. Uh I think part of the reason it, it does look faster, I think um, there's that subliminal feel in the way we tried to shoot it in the beginning. I was very excited when I came across that idea because I suddenly thought, oh, that's what it feels like to the dancers. Mm -hmm. That's in a way what I wanted to get at the film, if you're going to choose an opening image. So these, you sort of feel as close as I could get. Um, and as close as I have an incredible director of photography, uh, Tom Hurwitz, as close as we could get to actually being one of the girls running and you know sort of flinging themselves into midair and hoping that boy is going to be waiting there. <laughs> and you also see for the first time because normally you're sitting in a theater and you're you know in amongst a thousand people and you're kind of removed and you're kind of safe and suddenly you're up there and you realize there's all this equipment and there's this slippery stage and there's these lights you can bang into and. You know, you realize that everybody's out of breath, and suddenly it's like that heart beating thing. Mm -hmm. and, and you brought the breath in, the sound of the breath in over the music. But you should, perhaps we should mention that, that Tom Hurwitz has a dance background too, in that his mother is, isn't he the son of Jane Dudley? He's Jane Dudley's son, yeah. yes. It's, um, so he sort of may have a kind of kinetic sense. That was a lot of the, it was actually a lot of our original connection. When I was looking for a director of photography, and um, I think it may have been my producer, Jerry Kupfer, who suggested him to me, but I got a call and I, and I said, well, I, I, maybe I should see some material because I'll like him and I don't know, you know, and then I have to say no to somebody I started to enjoy talking to. He said, does this mean anything? He said to tell you he's Jane Dudley's son. I mm -hmm. said, oh, I, uh, because I knew that he was seeing, he would see dance the way I had seen dance, which is from sort of underneath. Uh -huh. Well, it was, it was very, and also in the Cloven Kingdom, I thought they really got, it's as if the camera got into that male circle, you know, you almost felt it looking over the shoulders and it was a completely different well, thing. Well, I'm not giving anything away, but that was not an actual performance. The, the, Tom was actually in there on stage with the dancers for some of those shots. Oh. It was done up at Purchase, I think. Uh -huh. on the stage there. Yeah, in the sort of the idea of we're representing what reality is rather than actually sort of being limited by the documenting of it, anything you see in the studio, any interview, anything, whether at dinner or walking down the street, is actually happening. Um, we felt that some of the, that what was critical, when you get to the, when you get, when, when the rubber meets the road, either these dances are working for the first time for those audiences out there that have not seen them, that don't have the basis of having attended uh, a Paul Taylor dance concert for 20 years. And it's either working now or it's not working. That's, you know, for eight bucks admission, you get that. And that meant that we had to have an opportunity for many of the dances to shoot them mm. fresh. And essentially under our, my control to say, you know, now I need another take. 
Well, yeah. now I need to get a crane yeah. in there. Well, now right. I and some of the steps were changed for the camera for some of those uh -huh. things. You know. That's part of the process. I mean, yeah, it's the there's nothing wrong with that. That's no. that's sort of what you do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Balanchine changed the whole ending of Four Temperaments for Dance in America. Did he? Yeah, it used to end differently. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And now they well, do Well, you that have ending. to work with the camera, you know, yeah. whatever. You know, there is a difference. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. Uh, Are you, were you one of those people who was from the beginning years ago excited about dance on camera? Were you? Well, I went to the movies and I thought, you know, Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly were nice, but. I didn't really relate uh -huh. personally, and uh, I was not. Um, I mean, the first time I was um, got an opportunity to do television here in the city, um, I hated it. Mm -hmm. I, I, it took me a long time to. They had to talk me into it. Um, I didn't want to do it at all, and I didn't enjoy it for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I, I had with Matt very much. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I think that there were many choreographers who were extremely distrustful with reason mm -hmm. about having their dances mm -hmm. filmed or, or mm -hmm. videoed. And mm -hmm. Well, the camera, you know, in, it's about the speed you mentioned before. The, the um, machine is not true to, to tempo, to speed, that is, visually. Things, at least to my eye, look faster mm -hmm. than they really are in real life. Mm -hmm. And they look also slower than they really do when we see them on the stage done by real people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a part of the equipment. I, I think they'll probably invent some new kind of camera someday that will give you a truer sense of speed. Um, it may be also that when we're seeing something um, two-dimensionally... Yes, that has to, because often camera work, you, the form or whatever is moving, coming straight at you, or it, it, it will move very quickly across the frame, and that gives you an impression of, of speed. Why did you decide to do some in black and white and some in color? I think I know the answer, but... <clears throat> Let's see if you really do. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, we decided that what's black and white in the film is very simple, other than the archival footage, which it either was <clears throat> black and white or it was color, and we used it as we got it. Um, the studio material is black and white, and reality, which is to say interviews and dinners and going to the Taj Mahal, is in color. and. Then what we shoot on stage was, you know, well lit and with makeup and all that. And I had done that because that's what reality feels like to me. You sort of go into rehearsal, which I did for many years when I was a dancer and a choreographer, and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's dusty and crummy and crappy and very creative, but, you know, sort of, it drags on all day long. There's not a lot of color. There's a lot of thinking and work. And then suddenly out of all that, you, one day you get to this performance and the background is bright blue or the floor is clear black and everybody looks beautiful and you're dancing with these people you don't recognize and i i, I wanted that visceral feel for the yeah. audience yeah well it's sort of the wizard of oz technique you know <laughs> she gets to oz and everything's solely Green. technicolor <laughs> but it's all been black and white before that mm -hmm. in the real world yeah and it's very grainy too sort of gritty and uh, the texture is a yeah, well, Tom chose stock, which I could not give you the numbers of, but chose um, film stock that reflected a lot of those concerns. Those were our conversations. You know, I'd say, well, I would say those things to him about rehearsal and what did he think and what did we think we could shoot. Mm -hmm. And he would switch back and forth depending on what we had discussed, and he's very good at what he does. So. How did, how did uh, it happen that the dancers were so open with you? I mean, they spoke very, in very relaxed, natural ways. Um, first of all, I, I, you know, I would sort of always thank, you know, Paul and the dancers and the administration and Ross and whatever for being so open and for just being there. I, I think that what, what, what delighted me was how articulate the, da the dancers were. I mean, to a, to a person, they were able to talk about their work and their feelings and, you know, kind of whatever direction we went in. I, I think part of it, though, was 
there were moments I think that it helped that I could talk their language, that I could say, okay, tell me about partnering. And once in a while, actually, it would almost go too far. I'd say, well, what's it like? You know, the, the audience wants to know. Um, what is partnering like? You know, there you are in a skin-tight unitard with another beautiful, with a beautiful man or a beautiful woman, and your body's going, oh, is that sexy? And they'd go, oh, come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd say, all right, all right, I know, but he doesn't know, all right, because they didn't really know Tom. I'd say, well, tell, look at me, but tell him. And then they'd get into it, and then after a while, they get lost in their own thought process, and it's wonderful to see that. Yeah, and sometimes you think maybe they were saying, articulating that for the first time. You know, you're thinking, well, does Rachel know that Patrick feels that strongly about her as a partner, or did she not learn it until she saw it um, on, the, on the film? Right. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I, I'm going through this conversation, but I'm not sharing with the others what somebody's just said to me an hour or a week before. Yeah. I'm seeing if we can't provoke the next thought or the next feeling. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sort of amazed at how certain things, you know, I know certain things were planned well in advance, and other things were you were lucky about, like the music breaking. But for instance, the I. I happened to mention Paul's dancing in Oriole. And then on comes Paul dancing Oriole. <laughs> now, was it just coincidence that I happened to talk about him and that you had happened to get him? I mean, how? Well, I was playing those tricks on you, too. Yeah, I mean, I mean... <laughs> did you ask me what Paul was like in Oriole or no, something I, so that I... I would say that? You know, I knew a, a fair amount about Paul's history by the time I was making the film. I mean, I had. You know, I'd studied his work and I knew a lot about it. Um, it had occurred to me, among the original ideas, uh, I recently reread some of my original notes, um, among one of the ideas was I, I thought that there was something very interesting about the legacy of the way dancing is translated from person to person, from generation to generation, from person to person. And I thought, oh, the Oriole solo is such a significant piece of work that, you know, it would be fun. The original idea was actually to see all the people who had ever done it. It would be cut in this sequence of six or eight or ten dancers, whatever, had, had done it. Didn't, um, so when we talked about it, I think that in that interview, I said to you, you know, tell me about Paul's dancing. I mean, is there a significant part you remember? And I don't remember if I said Oriole or not, but, I, you know, Slide. a little bit I'm leaving you to, leading you to water. Yes. And, <laughs> um, and then, but I knew that, but you weren't the only person I asked. I asked Betty DeYoung, and I asked, you know, anybody who might have seen it, I'm sure we, I talked to Paul about it and I talked to Patrick about it. You just, and then you, you sort of know, this is going to, you, I hope this is going to be a sequence. And you're sort of slowly but surely gathering the pieces and then dovetailing them together. And you try them in the editing room. I had an incredible editor named Pam Wise who won an award for this film. And um, we discovered that just between Paul's having done this years ago and Patrick in the studio was very, very effective. Mm -hmm. So then we're, we're done. We didn't go looking further. Amazing. When, um, when you were working with Francie, I think it was, you said something very interesting to me about the experience of the dancers' lives or lack of experience. And you said, I have to choreograph the mayhem into them. Mm -hmm. um, meaning, summon. The summon. No. Meaning that it has to come into the steps so that it, they have to do it. They can't avoid. Them. Well, I was. I think I meant. It's. I guess it's not clear. Um, that unless you've lived through something, it's hard to know what, mm -hmm. uh, what it felt like. Mm -hmm. And when the dancers haven't lived through, let's say, mayhem, it's a, you know, general term, but you get the idea. Um, there's a, there are ways to control what they do, to make it look like they have. Mm -hmm. And some dancers just are able to come up with the right look for the right feeling. Mm -hmm. And on others, they, it's very, the feeling is foreign to them. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to trick the, you, you gotta like choreograph their eyebrows or something, you know, it mm -hmm. gets very technical. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a scene also in which Betty says, I know what he doesn't like to see, 
which is a big mystery. What, what don't you like to see? <laughs> what does she mean? She meant one thing in particular. It's the Graham cross-legged sit on the floor. <laughs> <See. laughs> and there, I don't dislike it in itself. It's just that it looks too much like Martha, and I try not to steal. <laughs> well, she herself says she steals from the best. <laughs> well, it's true. We all do. Yeah. But uh, I wonder, what, what do you think of Clive Barnes's remark that he thought you did that to annoy Martha back oh, in 1957? he's so funny. <laughs> uh, he was, I don't know if he meant to make a joke, but of course that's not why. I did of course so. not. <laughs> But I liked it because it was funny. It didn't bother me that he said that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you must have some amazing outtakes. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. That's true. And? Well, I just wondered if those will disappear or if you'll, you will donate them to some library archive or sell them. I don't know. I don't know. Um, we, were, we were telling a story, oh. and we were telling a story that is based in fact. Um, I think most of, I think we had 100 hours of film roughly. It could be more, for all I remember. Um, there's, nothing, there's, there's nothing in there that sort of reveals, you know, somebody's incredible hate for somebody else or something that. like that. There's, there's, there's other interesting things. I don't know what we'll do. For the moment, I don't feel they should be seen. Just because I think it, it, it leads to a kind of second guessing or, mm -hmm. oh, what if I did it this way? Or what if it had been that way? Or what about that set of information? I, I don't think that's appropriate for some reason. Um, I had, uh, I, I got the film to, I think, about eight or nine minutes longer than it was, and then I worked closely with Mr. Scheuer, and he gave me notes, and we went back and forth until we both were happy that this was the story being told in the most efficient, mm -hmm. scintillating fashion or whatever. If those eight minutes were back, it wouldn't shock anybody. It would bore people to some extent. Um, I don't know what we'll do. We're, for the moment, we're well, being Well, you know what Pam, the editor, wants to do, don't you? No, I haven't heard She that. wants to make a television series on the outtakes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, for enough money, I could be convinced that uh, I, I hear television pays. Well, I, you know, I, I just always speak from the historian's point of view that 50 years from now, we need every shred of every moment. It's not in the process get, of being... You know? It's not going to be destroyed. I mean, no. I don't think uh, neither I nor... Anybody, Mr. Shoy, nobody wants this to be destroyed. I just don't think for the moment it should be open for viewing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it will well, something appropriate. For your sake. No, me, I'm not in it at all. I just think. No, I mean because of the things you Because this is a finished product. I think it's a didn't. sort of finished product. I think, that, I think also maybe, maybe some distance will make sense. I think, you know, I, I've seen playwrights do yeah, that. But Debbie's sort of not talking over. about for public viewing. Yeah, just no, I'm to, talking about archival. Oh, I'm sure it'll be archived, absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah. That it won't. It, yeah. I mean, it's holding at the edge of a table. I, I want to see that first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think maybe we have time to take a few questions from the audience. If there's anything out there that, anybody out there that would like to say anything or uh, ask a question? Yes, back there. The question is, how did I make the transition from dancer on the one hand to director today? Um, so the process of moving from d dancer to choreographer, I'm sure you all know about this, sort of common. Um, I had a dance company from 1980 to 1983, and I began to realize sort of seriously that was not the work I should be doing, that w my it's so funny. I used to think to myself, I wasn't supposed to be Paul Taylor. I don't think I can do that. I was supposed to try to be, you know, and then there, a lot of images came into mind, men I admire tremendously, you know, Herbert Ross or Bob Fosse or Jerry Robbins or whatever. Not that I think I can do that. But just that, that set of tools seemed to be very interesting to me to have a, a, just a, a different set of tools. 
cameras and actors and scripts and a libretto or whatever. I disbanded my company, and about a year later, oddly enough, I got introduced to the producer of a soap opera by my wife. And I went to her and I said, I want to direct your show. And they uh, let me observe. And then after a while, I convinced them to let me shoot a scene. And that went very well. And soon I shot a half a show in about a month. Now, this is over a long period. It was like six months. And then about a uh, you know, month after shooting the scene or starting to shoot shows, I had a contract. And I was directing a soap opera, which was 50 or 60 shows a year. And so that gives you a lot of experience. Anybody else? Question? Yes. Um, I, we shot for 25 individual days. We shot like two days in the studio, five days in India, stopped for two months, three days in the studio, two days at City Center, stopped for three months, go to. Um, yeah, I was working on a lot of other things in, in Los Angeles. I have, uh, you know, work that I do out there in television and hopefully film soon. Um, so that's the way this kind of I don't know always. I've never made another documentary. You'd have to talk to somebody who's made more documentaries. I think it goes lots of different ways, depending on how you structure something. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. First of all, my thanks to Cheryl for many years of delight. Um, can you estimate at all how many hours, how many days of work, how many months of work from the very first tenor rehearsal of the kids' whole mm -hmm. dance to the finished product? Let me think for a minute. We work, I usually, my attention span lately has been about two hours long. So say two hours a day, four days a week, because I take long weekends. Um, <laughs> the dancers come and work Friday. Um, so that's him. Eight a week. Eight a week, oh, and our rehearsal period was, well, you can't count the last week, because it has to be done in five weeks. So five times eight. 40 hours. 40 hours. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's fast. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're working with a limited budget, you have to learn to be fast. And the dancers are so quick. You show them something once and they've got it. It's just amazing to me. I wish you all knew them as well as I do. Well, after seeing that film, I think one of the things that happens is that you gradually come to know them better and better, so mm -hmm. that by the end, you can really identify mm -hmm. each one. Yes? Um, Mr. Taylor, uh, the film of your dancing was so exquisite. How, when did you stop dancing? How many years ago did you Oh, a long time. I, I don't know. I, I, I had 20 years of dancing, and I didn't start until I was about 22. So, and I, I don't know, so what made me, oh, who knows? I just thought it'd be a good idea, and I wasn't doing very well with what I thought I would like to do, which was to paint. And um, I just, I don't know, it just hit me. I can't explain it. It just seemed like a good idea. And I came to New York to learn to dance, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes about 20 years is enough in <laughs> your body. Yes, it's a, that's a, not a bad uh, run. Oh, no, it was a relief. <laughs> <laughs> no, not for me. I mean, I think many dancers really miss it, but I, because I, I'm doing other things now, and it's in a way easier. Um, I'm quite satisfied with what you know how it turned out. I think we could take one more question if there is one. Yes. Well, you talk in your movie about being motivated by fear. Well, you know when you people began to expect something of me, and the dancers always had. Even from the beginning, the dancer comes in and says, oh good, he's going to give me something really great. And, and so the, it's expected that, that you will produce. And of course, no one is that secure <laughs> that you know, you know what's going to might come out. So 
Um, in, in a way, the, the uh, being nervous and fearing uh, to fail or not produce, uh, I, I've groomed that because I know it works for me. So in a way, it's a little bit intentional too because if I get myself into a kind of you know, urgent um, anxiousness, it, it gives me a certain kind of energy when I go into work with the dancers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. 